Father, we thank you for the word. We bless you and praise you today. We ask you to open up the eyes of our understanding, open our hearts and our minds to this, and reveal to us and teach us by your Holy Spirit what we must know concerning prayer, concerning the things of prayer that you have designed so that heaven and earth can walk together in victory in spite of the enemies of God and the enemies of man. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share something that's very important with you right now. Now listen to this very carefully. Get this. Open up your your spiritual ears and, and listen to me. There are ideas about prayer that are not any more prayer then I'm a goose flying upside down. I mean, it just, it's just not prayer at all. And the world has the idea that it is, but it isn't. Now, there are safeguards and securities that God built into the prayer system not to keep you and me out of it, not to keep you and me from receiving from God, but to keep the devil from keeping you from receiving. For instance, the best illustration of this that I know of is the fact that you have money in the bank. If you put money in the bank, it belongs to you. It doesn't belong to anybody else. But if you don't follow the bank's prescribed procedures for the withdrawal of your money, you can't get it out of there. There's no way. Why? Are they trying to keep your money from you? No. They're trying to keep your money from everybody else. Why? There's a thief out there somewhere. My Lord, don't we know that in this generation? Thieves are everywhere. They steal your money, brother, if they can get their hands on it. So the bank has certain safeguards to keep anybody else from getting your money. Now, the Word of God says very plainly over in uh, James, the fourth chapter, you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Now, the first thing that goes wrong is you just don't ask at all. The second thing would be that you ask, but you ask amiss. You know, that's like going into the bank or fall down the middle of the floor and cry and squall and bawl and kick and scream, bang your head up against his desk. I want my money out of this bank. And then you say, well, have you filled out a withdrawal slip? Oh, no, watch watch a withdrawal slip, you know. No, that's the reason you had not got the money then because he's trying to keep you from getting it. You're going at it in the wrong way. And God has set certain procedures in into the prayer system and has given them all to us in his book and has given us the how to pray, the when to pray, the what to pray, and what the answers are when you pray that what. Praise God. Amen. Now, I have something I want to show you. This is an incident that happened in this ministry to people in this ministry They're not, uh, I mean, they're not some, God didn't hear this, hear the answer and give the answer to their prayer because they're such special, unusual people. I mean, man, they're they're just folks like you and me. Amen. Just a couple of kids that got married, fell in love with one another, fell in love with Jesus, got married. Jesus is in their life and they're learning and walking in the Spirit of God, getting hold of everything that they can and they had a disaster fly right into their face instantly, just came on them. And we need to watch and understand what they did and how they did it because there's not anything they did that you can't do. Now, I want you to watch this, and I want you to watch it very carefully. If you got your pen and paper right there by you, make notes as you go along, because this is going to be very, very important to your prayer life. Wonder Boy. On March 23rd, we were coming back from a youth rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. My husband and I were youth pastors at the Kenneth Copeland Church, and we had dropped the youth off at the church, and we were on our way home. And my husband had taken the van and Joshua, which was two and a half at the time, 
in, he was going on ahead, and I was following in the car. And we were just about a half mile, three quarters of a mile from the ministry, heading around a curve. Everything was normal. We'd had a wonderful weekend. Uh, it was just a good time. The kids were blessed. And all of a sudden, I heard the click of a noise, and I turned my head, and the side door of this van had swung open. I never even saw our son. And out the door he went, and I just swerved and skidded to a stop to keep from running over him with our back tires. And when Joshua went out the side door, um, Sandy saw him in the headlights of her car, and she saw him actually hit the, hit the pavement. It was like a dream. I mean, it's, it, I sound calm talking about it, but it was like, it was just a dream. It was slow motion, everything was in slow motion. That's when we went out into the hall. We're just waiting while he's in surgery, and then I slipped into the bathroom, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Well, about that time, a close friend of ours has been instrumental in our marriage and in our children's lives. Scott Johnson came into the restroom with me and uh, he hugged me, just gave me a supportive hug, said, it's all right, man, it's not your fault, don't worry about it. And he just kind of gave me a, a boost and it was enough that I shrugged the thoughts and I knew that I had to go on. That that fear or guilt was going to be an enemy to believe in God for, for Joshua's best. At that time, my husband was just walking back and forth up and down the hallway, just like marching almost and just praying and just saying, you know, just quoting scriptures and just really standing strong. I had made up my mind before that doctor came out. I did not care what that man said. He did not have the final say so. Jesus is the name above every name. All right, now, Brett has a choice to make. What's he going to do? Let's go back and, 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 and talk about a couple of things now before we finish here and see what happened. We know for a fact that it's not God's will for that little boy to bounce out of that car on his head. It's not God's will for that little boy to die. That, I mean, he hasn't, he hasn't lived out his lifetime. Not, that's not God's will. Now, Let's talk about Scott Johnson for a moment. He came in there at this point where Brett is just stunned. He, you know, you get caught in something like this. I mean, man, it's just thrust on you. One, one second you're driving down the highway after having a blessed weekend, and, and the ne next thing you know, <laughs> dear God, you're in a hospital standing somewhere and your boy's about to die. I mean, man, this is just like that. Well, you know life is that way. Now... Scott could have done one, any one of several things. He could have come in there and said, Now, Brett, you know, we never know the mysterious ways of God. We just have to accept whatever comes our way. He'd have killed him. He could have also come in there and said, well, now what do you think about this God you serve? I mean, you spent all weekend out here witnessing and, and praying for other people's kids and getting them off of dope and all that, and he just let yours fall out of the back of the van. No, God didn't let him fall out of the back of the van. In, the, in truth and reality, Brett did. He ought to lock the door, and that kid should have been strapped in. But see, you can spend all your time trying to figure out, oh, what should we have done? Oh, then we'd have just done this. No, 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 that's not the answer to the thing. That's the answer the next time you get in the car after all this is over with. But it don't work now, right now in this. That isn't it at all. So, what did he do? Did you hear what he said? I made up my mind before that doctor came in that room, whatever he said was not going to be the last word in the thing. Did you catch that? Did you catch what Scott told him? He said, listen, brother, this is not your fault. Now, you can do this. You, you can, th did you hear the encouragement? You hear him exhorting in the Word of God? Praise God. Now we're set up to receive from God and stop all this, this mental pressure 
that's coming in there. Satan is trying his best to steal Brett and Sandy's little boy. Now let's see what they did. Imagine the horror of realizing that your child has fallen out of the side of a moving van. The sheer terror of seeing his motionless body on the side of the road. And the pain of being told by doctors that he might never walk or talk again. Brett and Sandy know these feelings, and they share them with us in part two of the Joshua Bond story. So the doctor came out and he said, we have to take Joshua into surgery. I, and I said, well, what for? And they said, well, um, if we don't do surgery on him in 15 minutes, he will die. And, and I mean, it was just like, I mean, some people got behind me because they were just expecting me to pass out. And I mean, I just got weak kneed and everything. And my husband said, well, well, what's wrong? And he said, well, he has a concussion back here and several lacerations. The doctor said he'd suffered a brain laceration and he severed the major speech center of his brain. I mean, this is word for word what this man's saying. He said the bone severed the major speech center of his brain and he said he will not talk. I mean, right there in the hallway, you know, he just comes out of surgery and he land blasts with this. And for a two-year-old to have a three-inch piece of his bone go into his brain, it would be, you know, it was almost all of his brain that was severed. And he said, the, the brain is the only organ that does not heal itself, and so he has a 40% chance of living, and he has 0% chance of talking. He said he will never talk. And the revelation came to me. I didn't have to beg God to heal my son. It was God's will. He wanted my son well more than I did. And I think a lot of times when people pray, they go before God and say, oh God, just heal my son or just do this. And it's not a matter of just this. It's the very nature of God to make us well. And it wasn't something I was going to have to beg God into doing. The bottom line was we had to know it was God's will. We apply the word of God to what his will is and it'd be brought to pass in our son's life. In the intensive care, we took a tape recorder that was a continuous play. And on one side, we put Kenneth Copeland's healing scriptures, and on the other side, we put Gospel Duck, because he had loved Gospel Duck. So we put those, and we put the little tiny earplugs that just hook in his ears, so he was continuously listening to that. He was still comatose, in a deep coma, was, you know, non-functional, and still total life support. And I, mean, I remember the nurses saying, could you please get, a, before we got the earphones, we got the earphones the second day, but the first day we didn't have them. And they said, could you please get another tape because that healing script, the scripture tape is just driving us bananas. And I said, no, I cannot. <laughs> they said, he doesn't know what that's saying. I said, but his spirit knows. God honored Brett and Sandy's faith and Joshua lived, but the road to recovery was still long. The first physical therapy lesson that we took him to it was just like laying a piece of spaghetti on, on the mat. He wouldn't do anything. So the second lesson, which was two days later, he started holding his head up. And the third, he started sitting up and they would balance him. It was just like an infant. They went through the whole infant steps with him. And about the sixth physical therapy lesson, he was, he was sitting up on his knees. And I asked the physical therapist, what's the next thing you want him to do? And she said, well, it would be a miracle if he would crawl. And I said, okay, by the next time I have him come in here, he'll be crawling. And she said, well, how do you plan on doing that? And I said, well, with a little practice and lots of prayer. Monday morning, we walked in there. I set him on the mat. And I said, Joshua, come here. And he hopped up on all fours and just took off crawling. And I said, okay. I just looked there. I said, what next? What do you want him to do now? And she said, well, I guess you can get him to walking. Wednesday we came in and he walked in and she just started bawling and she just said I can't believe she goes this is the grace of God and 12 days earlier she was agnostic and she just she called everyone over there to look at him and she said well I guess you don't need any more physical therapy she said come back in about three months just so I can see how strong he is and how he's doing Jesus loves the little children all the children of the world Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And one year later, 
Joshua is a healthy, happy, normal four-year-old boy. A living testimony for everyone to see. And for him, the sky is the limit. Now, I want you to see certain things that doesn't thrill you. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want you to see certain things that they did because they knew to do them. They weren't guessing what to do. They weren't spending their time crying and caring. Oh, we're so unworthy. Oh, God, and carrying on with all of that kind of trash. Man, he'd kill that boy. He wouldn't, have lasted, he wouldn't have lasted through the night. And even if he had lived, it, it would have just been a, a, a horror for the rest of their life. What did they do? All right, first of all, they recognized the fact that even though his brain was incapacitated, his spirit was not. And they recognized the fact that God's power and God and His Word are one. They recognized the fact that they had the right to pray in the name of Jesus and the right to believe God for the results. And Brett realized that God doesn't want my boy in this kind of a mess. And he began to open the door for God to move instead of shutting God out by assuming that God didn't care anything about them because of all the past religious traditions and so forth that society and religion has, has messed prayer up with. Now, another thing was the fact that Sandy was willing to fight for what was hers regardless of what other people thought about her. If you're, if you're going to spend all your time worrying about what people are going to think if I take that scripture tape in there, Oh, what people are going to think about me. You're going to lose your children. You'll lose your job. You'll lose wherever the devil has put the pressure on you to take you out. Well, that, that nurse said, Well, that scripture tape is about to drive us bananas. Well, that's all right. Go on and go bananas. We ain't playing it to you. We're not in here on account of you. We're in here on account of this boy, and I've made up my mind. My boy is not going to die in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Ooh, glory to God. I'll tell you this, something happens when the boldness of faith comes because you know what the Bible has to say and you know what God has to say and you know where you stand in faith. <laughs> Amen. Now, one thing that I want you to realize out of this is the fact that Brett and Sandy learned how to handle themselves like that through this ministry. Now, I'm not saying that as some kind of advertisement for this ministry that would make me look good. That isn't it at all. I don't know all there is to know about prayer. I'm learning daily what there is to know about prayer. I mean, I've had some things today that, that uh, my mind questions and I wonder how to handle this. But I have learned enough to, to, to be able to share with you what I shared with Brett and Sandy that helped get through these kind of things. And that's not the only incident that that's ever happened to because it's happened to me, it's happened to my children, it's happened to my family. Lots of incidences over the years that we've just had to pray our way through and pray our way out of and some things we had to pray our way into. I mean things that had to do with physical life and tragedy and, and life and health and death and, and finances and everything else you can think of. Because over 20 years ago, we put Jesus Christ of Nazareth first in our lives. That don't mean the problems don't come. That doesn't mean you don't have any problems. If it'll do anything, it'll increase your problems. Because Satan comes immediately to take the word out which is sown. I mean, he's after the ones that are most dangerous to him. But thank God you have... You have Jesus, you have God's way, you have His Word, you have His name, you have His Spirit and His weapons of our warfare are not carnal but powerful through God. So even though you do have problems, even though they do come, thank God by the grace and the mercy of God and His Word and the power of our faith, we can do something about the problems instead of just lay down before them, let the devil make a rug out of you. Now... I said all that because I wanted you to realize, and I showed you that because I wanted you to realize, that if you'll stick with us, stay with us in this study, you will learn things about praying that will open the eyes of your understanding and put you in a place to solve and, and 
have God work in your life and not only steady it, but change things and take you out of those things that have been destroying your life and put you over into a place of victory in Christ Jesus. I want to share these things with you. I heard another story like that one time that in the future we'll share with you. And as, as this young woman was giving her testimony, and, I, and it dawned on me, I believe it was the Spirit of God sharing it with me, that she learned how to pray that, and she learned the information that she used, the way uh, Sandy Bond l- had learned that his spirit was alive, that the fact that his, that his body wasn't functioning right didn't mean that his spirit wasn't alive to God and alive to them. And... Uh, And when I heard that, I thought, dear God, I have to go teach people the things that I've learned. I haven't learned it all. We're going to learn more, praise the Lord. But I can share with you what I have learned. Now, as I was praying about this series, I wrote this down. This came in my study time about this prayer series, and I want you to listen to it. Luke 18, 1, Jesus said, men ought to always pray and not faint, cave in, or give up. Now, you can turn that around. The Apostle Paul said, pray unceasingly. You can turn that around like this. Men ought ought to pray always. Men ought to always pray. Listen to this. Prayer is always available to everyone. There is no situation that that one can find himself in that disqualifies him from prayer. The deepest of sinners in the deepest of sin can still pray the prayer of repentance. And from that point, he qualifies to continue in the other fields of prayer. Jesus is a faithful high priest. The only situation from which there is no deliverance is the rebellious refusal to pray at all. Just to not pray at all, just refuse to pray. That is the situation from which there's no deliverance. God's Word, His part of our prayers is available to whosoever will. His mighty name in which we pray, the promises of His Word, is being offered to whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now let's you and I pray right now. It's, it's, it's coming to a place very soon where you, I'm not going to do your praying for you. The way we've done it in the past is just, just not pay any attention to it at all until something like this happens and then hunt the pastor up. Oh, call Brother Roberts. Oh, call Brother Coleman. Oh, get glory and lay hands on me. No, praise God. That's all fine and good, but let's learn how ourselves and not get caught in losing precious time and have to have somebody else pray for us. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for this television audience. I raise my faith up to you for them and with them to open the eyes of our understanding and give us your life and your word and your knowledge concerning our prayer life. Make them whole every whit. In Jesus' name, amen. 